Okay, now let's. You know, we're already behind, and this, I've got quite a few slides. So, um, I always like to put this up here, and the reason is is that about ten years ago, I originally gave a presentation similar to this to a group of students uh, that had heard about it up at uh, Colorado School of Mines, and I was pretty much tacked at the end by two professors that felt like. Anybody that's presenting something other than the carbon dioxide theory as to why we may have global warming is feeding our students things that shouldn't be fed. And that's more or less what they said at the end. I was absolutely astounded. So the whole idea here, of course, is this pretty much sums everything up. This is one of the things that we do in field geology, obviously, is that when we go out and we look at outcrops, we look at lots of different... Uh, small pieces of data and ultimately get to the point where we feel like, okay, we've got multiple working hypotheses. The most critical thing is understanding that there may be a lot of ways to explain something. The author who has only one idea is going to look for the evidence to support that idea and then discard anything that doesn't support that idea. And this is what G.K. Gilbert would say. The other thing is, <laughs> this is the only time that you're going to see this guy's name anywhere near that guy's name. <laughs> all right, let's keep going. Now, how does all of this start? How does an old field geologist, which most of you that know me, I think you know that I've done a lot of work and a lot of maps for the survey and done work for Tim and mining companies, etc. So how does a field geologist get involved with solar variations and its potential to change the climate? And it all reverts back to ham radio. This is when I, I started in ham radio back when I was about 14 years old. And back then, it was the video game uh, computer tinkering in the basement of today, only this is how we started back then. And we seeded a lot of uh, electrical engineers, a lot of people that got into science, and I was one of them. And when I went to school uh, thinking I was going to be an electrical engineer, that didn't pan out because I, the math was a little bit too, uh, too difficult. So anyway, it wasn't why I got into geology. I got into geology because somebody offered me a job one summer, and I went out into the field, and that's when I decided, okay, that's it. But the interest in science stemmed from ham radio. <clears throat> um, ham radio has come a long ways over the last uh, 50 years or so since I've been in it. We started uh, back then, we had to have Morse code, and I still use Morse code almost exclusively. And there are probably half a million, a million, different people around the world that are still old dinosaurs like myself that still use Morse code. It's a great way, uh, it's almost like mental telepathy. I've enjoyed it for so many years. And uh, of course, it was kind of the basis that got me started in, in science. Now, why is ham radio important? as far as solar variations. And it turns out even Marconi knew this back in, what, 1908, something like that, 1903. And that is, there is ionization in the upper atmosphere, roughly the ionosphere, 50 to 500 miles above the Earth's surface. And it is ions, that is primarily hydrogen helium ions that have been stripped of an electron, so therefore they're up there in this upper portion and they have a tendency at certain frequencies to reflect radio waves, partially reflect radio waves, short waves, okay? So if you're operating on certain bands, and back in the old days when you listened to Voice of America or BBC or whatever, you listened on your short wave radio, you were getting what we consider, or what the CBers call skip, okay? So that is, depending on the angle of takeoff of your station, then you can get a reflection, you go over, it's like skipping rocks on, on the water. So therefore, we are very uh, tuned in as ham operators to ionization of the upper atmosphere, the ionosphere. And it turns out that this is very cyclical. There are times when you can take a handheld radio on a certain frequency and talk to the other side of the world via skip. There are times when you can have a very powerful station, several thousand watts, and you can have very, very nice antennas, and you're not going to get very far. Maybe continent, I mean, maybe east coast to west coast in the United States, or maybe around Europe to maybe northern Africa. Why is that? Sunspots. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. 
Okay, so here's kind of a, a depiction of what happens. And you can see that uh, if you were to have a lower takeoff angle, then you're going to have angle of incidence and reflection graders. And, or you can have multiple skips, and it turns out that the surface of the Earth, especially the oceans, are very good reflectors as well. So this is how you get global transmission on shortwave frequencies. You don't need satellites. We didn't need that back in the old days, and we still don't, we don't need it now. It's considered somewhat of an archaic form of transmission of signals, but it is still sometimes the most uh, consistent and uh, sometimes, um, sometimes it's your last resort, for example, in hurricanes, tornadoes, etc. Ham operators are the guys that are on the front line. Now, I don't want to pick on these guys, but I'm going to pick on them. Okay? <laughs> This is your Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is what got me in trouble up at uh, Colorado School of Mines, I think. Because there were a couple of guys in the back room that probably had some uh, grants for this. And I came down pretty hard on them, and I'm not going to do that quite so much now. <laughs> Anytime you get the politicians involved, probably going to be a problem. Okay, so self-proclaimed uh, climate change experts. There are several reasons that I would pick on them, and that is they have a fairly poor track record of doing truthful science. So let's talk about a little bit of that real quick. Okay, they obviously are doing um, a lot of correlation trying to say that climate change, drastic changes in climate, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, etc are a result of anthropogenic global warming, that is, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, I have no doubt that that may have some significance, but I don't think it's everything. We're going to go right back to multiple working hypotheses, as uh, suggested by G.K. Gilbert. All right, so there were a lot of things that were uh, exaggerated in a lot of their reports, and there's been quite a bit of critique as a result of that, and these folks have, uh, have kind of uh, backpedaled a bit in some instances, but they're still uh, promoting the carbon dioxide anthropogenic warming uh, scenario very heavily. So you can see here there is an exaggeration from 26 to 55. There's even more exaggerations here. Okay, And you get the idea that, okay, maybe this isn't everything. So what really is going on out there? And it turns out probably a combination of a lot of things, but let's do this first. Let's go back as good scientists, that's a little bit blurry, even though I don't have my glasses on, let's go back as good scientists and let's start looking at <coughs> what is the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. So obviously 78% nitrogen, 20-22% depending on where you are, oxygen. Then you've got these small amounts and actually water vapor 1%. And it turns out that all global uh, uh, climate change experts are going to tell you that, yeah, water vapor probably is, or is, the largest contributor to greenhouse gases. It has the most effect, more effect than anything else. But it turns out when you look at this little sliver right here, there's your carbon dioxide, 0.03%. So it's pretty insignificant. Now, let's go and talk about the carbon dioxide makeup, because we're all familiar with this. This is the first thing you're going to get hit with in the proponents of carbon dioxide uh, global warming, and that is the Keeling curve. And you can see we've extracted that. This is actually from ice cores that go all the way back through here. But you can see that as we get more and more data, now when we get up into the 50s, this has gone from roughly 300 and what is that, 315 to 409. So you're looking at a, what, 30, 32, something like that percent increase over the last, what, 60, 70 years. And then this is what most people are using as the driving force in saying that, okay, all of this increase in carbon dioxide is going to correlate with the rise in sea surface temperatures or global temperatures. And as such, this, this becomes their primary weapon. So you can see here, now this is the global temperature anomaly. So basically this is based on the changes from the moving average, more or less, over time. And you can see going all the way back to 1860, which there's not very much data on, you can see that we have periods of cold in here that where it's 
below the average temperature, and then you can see that it started to increase above the average temperature, especially since 1950. So this correlates well with your Keeling curve, okay? And this is one of the things that so many of the proponents of carbon dioxide and anthropogenic warming are uh, using as a correlation. Now, let me just say, and I'll say this numerous times throughout the talk, correlation is not causation. Everybody's heard that how many times, okay? Mm -hmm. I can correlate this with, as a matter of fact, last night I was thinking, hey, I can correlate this with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. <laughs> <laughs> but then somebody who's really says, yeah, and it should correlate with the Dow Jones Industrial Average because it's a marker of the degree of industrialization that we've had on the planet since hmm. 1900 or 1920 or whatever. Hmm. So therefore, that's probably not a good correlation, but you get the idea. Correlation is not causation. So let's go and look at some of the other things that may be happening here, using our laws of multiple working hypotheses. Okay, I, I probably should just have <clears throat> an entire slide with all of my information on it. Okay, so here's the thing that is really important here. Correlation is not causation, however, let's go and look at what the data are telling us, and that is, based on this study back here in 2009, these guys had found that, okay, there was this thing called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum 55 million years ago. Very well substantiated that there was a significant increase in temperature and carbon content. How do we determine carbon content? Well, numerous cores worldwide. So there's incredible numbers of cores out there. You can look at drilling rigs, you can look at all of the oceanographic information. And you can see that there is a real increase in the amount of carbon in this very narrow period at the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And it turns out that we can also determine, along with the carbon increase, okay, we can also see that there was an increase in temperature. Now, we do a lot of this from cores, isotope work. We can understand temperature based on th such things as foraminifera. That is, the calcareous shells of the little critters that die in the ocean and fall down to the bottom. We can look at the isotope content and we can get a good correlation of what the temperature was at the time. So we have two pieces of information here. We have the Paleocene, Eocene, or that is, we have the uh, carbon content. And I think on the next slide it's going to show you that the carbon content increased something like 70% over just a few thousand years based on these cores. And you can see that temperatures increase 13 degrees Fahrenheit. So we've got a 70% increase in carbon dioxide. We have a 13% increase in, or that is a 13 degree increase in the temperature. And when you plug all of this into the IPCC climate models, it turns out that we don't have enough carbon dioxide to substantiate the temperature increase. In other words, the 13 degree temperature increase is not in direct correlation with the computer models that the IPCC is using to substantiate the temperature increase based on the amount of carbon dioxide. So these authors came to the conclusion that there's something else out there other than CO2 that is causing an increase in temperature, at least in the geologic record. Okay. Now what that does to me it opens your mind up to go, hey, let's go back to G.K. Gilbert. There are some other things out there that could potentially influence temperature increases rather than just the increase in carbon dioxide content. Okay? It kind of makes sense that not one thing is going to explain everything. So what are the other things that possibly could relate to an increase in temperature? It turns out there's a lot of things, and they probably all have some degree of effect, okay? So we can go back to volcanic activity, meteorite impact. Virtually they are the same thing. That is, they do the same basic thing. It's putting a lot of material up in the upper atmosphere, which is going to shield the heat and the light from the sun so that we'll have a decrease in temperature based on these two. Planetary perturbations and resonance is fancy work for Bob's Milankovitch cycle. Milankovitch cycles mean that as the Earth rotates around the Sun, there are slight variations. And it turns out there's also some variations based on where we are 
in our 250 million year rotation around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So all of these things over time seem to have some correlation that we have changes in the amount of radiative heat or light that is coming from the sun. Then we also have continental masses, oceanographic currents. All of this is very important to our weather and climate. If you've ever had an oceanography course, you know that the positions of the continents, the deep sea bottom currents, Antarctic bottom water, etc., etc., all of this is really, really important in understanding the circulation patterns. And if you're all familiar with La Nina and El Nino, you know that those circulation patterns are extremely influential in affecting our climate, affecting the storms, affecting the temperature, etc. Okay? Now, biological activity, all of this is really important. All of it, at some point, has more influence than perhaps the other at certain periods of geologic time. We're all familiar as geologists with what? Probably 12 different Pleistocene advances and retreats of the ice. Okay? All of that is not a result of anthropogenic activity because we were around back then. So there are obviously things going on that are causing the changes in the climate over long periods of time that we're not factoring into the equation. And it turns out we are factoring into the equation. There's a lot of information out there about this. What we're going to talk about right now is, where is it? There it is, variations in solar emissions. Okay. <coughs> Real quick clarification, most of the people that are not on board with the solar variations are saying, hey, the radiative, or they call it the irradiative constant of the sun, the light and the heat, changes very little. That is, even over the solar cycles that I'm going to tell you about later, that's very, very insignificant, like 0.1%. But now we're talking about the electro radiation. We're talking about the light and the heat. There's something else out there that is going to be very important for my story here, okay? And that is the sun. And it turns out the magnetics of the sun are going to be the main uh, uh, influence that we have here. All right, now, we all know about this. We know about weather. We know about the sun as far as the light, heat, the tilt of the Earth's axis, the rotation around the sun. All of this is going to affect the ocean currents. It's going to affect the biological activity. It's going to affect the amount of moisture. It's going to affect the northern latitudes, bringing a lot of the colder weather in. You get the idea. Being weather you know, savvy, we know that the sun is extremely important. When we refer to this change in weather pattern over decades or millennia, we now refer to it as climate. And it turns out we all know, based on what we were just talking about earlier as far as Pleistocene bits, climate changes over long periods of geologic time. Time that is much wider in expanse than we humans get to experience. But we can see it all in the geologic record. So now then, let's look at a few things about the sun because that's what we're going to talk about here. Okay, it's a star and it is a common garden variety star in the overall makeup of all galaxies. We're not going to talk about HR diagrams, but if you're familiar with those, basically our sun falls right in the middle of just an average garden variety star. Okay. It's 100 times the diameter of the Earth, 300 times the mass. A star, all stars more or less accumulate from hydrogen, uh, primarily in nebula. So we've got, for example, if you go look at the Crab Nebula, look at the Great Nebula in Orion, you look at these. These are star fact Pleiades is another one. If you look up into the night sky and you see these, then you see that there are these vast stellar uh, blurs, and that's gas. It's primarily hydrogen gas. These are star factories for the most part. That gas is going to slowly accumulate based on gravitational attraction of the other hydrogen. And eventually it gets to the point where it forms a large mass. The ma large mass based on the hydrogen that accumulates is then going to increase in temperature because the little molecules start to vibrate. As they get more and more expansive, <clears throat> more and more dense, Gravity takes over, they become closer and closer together, the temperature increases, and all of a sudden, boom, we get a star that turns on. Okay? And it starts then burning the hydrogen to helium. And that's what almost all stars are burning right now until they get in the later stages of their lives. The sun is no different. An average garden variety star converting hydrogen to helium. So let's talk about that. <coughs> 
here in the center. Now these are in Kelvin. I'm going to give you these uh, in uh, Fahrenheit. Here in the center, this is where the actual thermonuclear reactions are taking place. This is where the hydrogen, which makes up 78% right now, I think, of the sun, this is where it's being converted to helium. The temperature is 27 million degrees Fahrenheit in the center. As those thermonuclear reactions take place, we call that nucleosynthesis. What happens is the sun is losing or using up all of its hydrogen, and then eventually that's going to become helium. Then the helium starts to gravitate towards the center, and the temperature increases, and then the helium goes to lithium. And then the next thing is lithium goes to number four on the periodic chart, and you go right on up. So as each stage occurs, the star is now on its death throes. Once it uses up its hydrogen, it goes to helium. Okay? All this is really neat stuff that's going on, and eventually you get up to number 26, and I'm going to say this because most people in here are geologists. When you get up to number 26, that happens to be iron. A garden variety star like the Earth can no longer reach the temperatures at the end of converting 25, on the, which is what magnet, whatever, manganese to iron. And when it gets to the point where it can no longer, because of its size, reach the temperatures required to fuse iron into element number 27, it's over. Mm -hmm. So what happens is something like the Earth will become a red giant. But if it is a large enough star, twice, three times, four times the size of the Earth, it then will implode due to the gravitation. See, the heat turns off. That's one thing I didn't tell you. How does the star, like the sun, stay the same size? How is it stable? Because the heat from within is pushing it out, but the gravitation of all of the other material, primarily the hydrogen, is holding it in. The sun is in equilibrium. The amount of burning going on in the interior from the fuel that is now being uh, radiated out towards the surface, all of that now is being countered by the gravity. So you've got gravity trying to move it in, you've got the heat trying to move it out, and our star is nice and stable, which is really great because that's the only way we're going to have maintain life on the Earth. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you are a star three or four times the size of the Earth, now the gravity starts to implode after it gets to element 26, and boom it becomes a supernova. That's how you produce elements 27 through 92 on the periodic table. That's how gold gets produced. Not because of the normal fusion of a garden variety star, but because a larger star at some point was in the vicinity of our solar system. And that, once it imploded and exploded on the rebound to create the supernova, that's how the elements 27 through 92 are produced. Mm -hmm. So, kind of an interesting thing. What that means is, we're in a, at least a second generation area of a pre-existing star. Our star is a result of a second, maybe a third generation, and that makes sense. <laughs> the Earth's four and a half billion years old, the universe is 13.6, something like that. Okay, enough of that. Mm -hmm. What happens when all this stuff starts getting heated down here? It's going to radiate outwards. So that's going to be really important because you've got this zone called radiation zone. Also important are these areas up near the surface called the convection zones. So just like the Earth is going through all the convective cycles that it is at the mid-oceanic ridges, where we've got all this new material coming out causing what our plate tectonic C4 spreading scenario, <clears throat> we've got the same thing happening on the Sun, except it's much more <clears throat> complex. And the reason it's more complex is because it's 100 times the size of the Earth, plus all of these little things that are radiating out are not heat from rocks. It's not coming up transmitting the heat through the rocks. It's plasma. What the heck is plasma? It's nothing but essentially a bunch of molecules or ions that have been stripped, elements that have been stripped of an electron. So basically we've got all of this charged material now because of the tremendous amount of heat that's being stripped of electrons and it's essentially a fluid or a type of gas, essentially, that is moving outwards into these convection zones. And guess what? When you start moving things around that have one less electron than they supposedly have, they now become magnetic. Really important. The magnet, or the magnetism of the sun, is really the driving force. 
Now, on the surface, we have these things, and you know about this. We have flares, we have prominences, we have coronal mass ejections. We're going to talk about all that. When you start stripping electrons away from primarily hydrogen and helium, you're going to get X-ray and gamma ray emissions. So we've got all of these things coming out of the sun. And our magnetic field of the Earth protects us from that nasty stuff for the most part. Okay? All right, so now the next thing I want to show you is after we radiate this material out, we've got the convection zones. By the way, these convection zones, because of their complexity, cause a tremendous amount of variations in the magnetic field of the sun. It's not the nice little dipole effect that we all see from the basic uh, science course that we had a number of years ago. <laughs> <coughs> the photosphere is considered the surface of the sun. We've got 27 million degrees here, and we have somewhere around 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of the sun. 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit from 27 million. The inner atmosphere of the sun is not listed here. It's called the chromosphere, but the outer atmosphere of the sun is called the corona. Okay? And it turns out the corona should be cooler because our atmosphere is cooler than the actual surface of the earth, isn't it? Yeah. So you would think that the corona would be less than 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Two to five million degrees. Whoa. How is it that I can have an atmosphere up here that is millions of degrees hotter than the actual surface of the sun? And the answer is magnetism. Okay. So let's go take a look at that real quick. In order to understand the sun, you have to understand the sun's magnetic field. This is a very basic description, or at least a, a you know a, a, a plot to show you how complex these geo, these magnetic fields are on the sun. Remember, 100 times the size of the Earth, and all of these are emanating out from areas that are sunspots. And they arc back over because of the complexity of all the convection that's going on. Remember, I've got all this material down, this plasma, that is circulating around in all of these small different convective currents. And then they get perhaps into a larger convective current that's incorporating all the smaller. And you've got ions that are moving around, and that's causing a very complex magnetic field. And as a result, look at what we've got here. And it becomes even more complex as it continues on on a day-to-day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day -to -day basis because it turns out that the sun has a tremendous amount of variability based on its solar cycle, which we'll talk about here in just a few seconds. Okay? All right. So, sunspots. Got them all up there. Okay. Here's the cool thing. Cool thing? No. Here's the thing about sunspots. They've been observed since Galileo. Remember, good old Galileo got himself in trouble with the church because he found imperfections on the surface of the sun. So that was in, what, 1635, something like that, when he started. Turns out the Chinese have records that even go back farther than that. So they've been observing the sun. There are large, dark regions, and they are relatively cool. In other words, 1,500 degrees. Remember I told you the surface of the sun on average is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun spots are 8,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're cool spots. And that's why they show up as spots. So let's go take a quick look at what a sunspot looks like here. There we go. Oh, come on. There we go. If we look at sunspots, we find, number one, they're in groups. Okay? And if you look at them in more detail, you'll find out that each group has an area where there might be some slight variations in temperature, but then they're isolated in the centers where there is a distinct difference in temperature from the surface, and that's why they show up as spots. Now, here's the other cool thing about sunspots. It shows us that the sun actually has rotation. That is, at the equatorial regions, if you were to follow these sunspots, it would take like 30 days for them to go all the way around and come back to this exact same position. So we would monitor these over a 30-day period and see that this group would rotate here and here and here and here, and then it's going to become invisible as it goes on the other side of the sun. Fifteen days later, it's going to come in over here and it's going to rotate right back to this position in about 30 days. And it turns out that up in here in the polar regions, 
The circulatory pattern of the sun is 25 days. Hmm, okay, cool. What does that have to do with anything? What it has to do with is that it is causing a winding up of the sun's magnetic field. The magnetic field of the equatorial regions is such based on the convective activity, and then you've got a different torsional relationship with the sunspots in the magnetic field in the polar regions. What happens over time is that it winds up and becomes even more complicated than the previous diagram that I showed you. And when it winds up to a certain spot, it goes beep, and it changes its polarity, and it roughly goes back to zero again. Guess what? That happens every 11 years, roughly. How many? 10 to 12 years, 10 to 13, but we average it at 11. So every 11 years, we get this change in the sun's magnetic field so that the solar cycle and the sunspot count <coughs> goes to roughly zero, and then it starts coming right back again as the circulatory pattern of the convection in the interior of the sun starts developing the magnetic field into the previous complexity that it was in before the, the 11 year bing, okay, when it got all wound up. So this is how kind of this is how we kind of understand what's going on as far as sunspots and the solar cycle. If you want to know why the temperature on the surface is 8,500 at a sunspot and it is 10,000 degrees around it, it is because the sunspots are where below you have the most intense magnetic field. So in other words, sunspots are the indicators of where the complexities of the magnetic field are located. That's where they come to the surface. And what happens is the heat is altered. As the heat comes up from these convective currents from the radiative zone, it then is, because of the magnetic field, they're deflected somewhat to the sides, which above the surface explains why you have an 8,500 degree temperature versus a 10,000 degree temperature. Okay? So here's what happens now that I am going to cork this activity. I'm going to now eventually get either a flare or a prominence. Okay? So let's go talk about those real quick. Actually, you don't even need to read that. Let's go through these. Okay. Here we have magnetic fields that are preventing the heat to escape and as we, as a result, on the surface of the sun, we have sunspot. And it turns out these sunspots oftentimes have certain polarities, positive or negative. So when all of a sudden one of these sunspots bottlenecks the heat up enough, it eventually gets to the point like taking a Coca-Cola or champagne, taking the top off of it and boom. And that's result, that results in a solar flare or a solar prominence. A solar prominence is when this sunspot, for example, has bottlenecked everything up and eventually it blows. The flare goes up. It starts out as a flare, but because it is magnetically charged in one polarization, it then is attracted back to another sunspot area that is of the opposite polarity. And that's called a prominence. A flare is when it just goes up in the air and there's nothing else to attract it, and it continues on until it expels all of its material. Okay? So, here, let me show you a couple of slides. This would be a prominence. Here's the Earth down here for size. There it is. So here's prominence where you had this sunspot that eventually bottlenecked up the heat to the point to where it exploded. And when that material then came up, it goes out. Look at that size of the Earth. So you're talking, uh, I don't know, millions of miles. And then it arcs back and it comes into an opposite polarity field. It comes back to the surface. If we're looking at a solar flare, just half of that continues. That is, here's the spot. I have the explosion, and there's nothing to attract it back to the other side. So we just refer to that as a solar flare. Now, there are these other things that you have heard about. Coronal mass ejections, CMEs. And what happens is now this is where the corona becomes so important because remember I told you earlier that the surface of the sun, the, the, the photosphere, is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but we're looking at 2, 3, 4, 5 million degrees Fahrenheit in the corona, which is the atmosphere. And what happens there is the same thing. These magnetic fields that are so complex are causing the concentration of heat into certain areas because 
They're all ionized. They have polarity. So therefore, the concentration based on the magnetic activity in the sun concentrates this stuff until virtually the same thing happens as happens on the surface. The corona gets so hot, boom, it explodes. This is material now that gets funneled into the uh, planetary, uh, you know, interplanetary space. So this stuff is coming off the sun, and as it explodes, this material is directed to whatever direction it's going, and if the Earth happens to be in the way, this becomes a real problem. How many of you heard about the 1859 Carrington event? Okay, so the Carrington event, this is kind of interesting, and I'm, geez, I, I gotta get through these slides. The Carrington event was really important because back in those days we had telegraph operators. We had all these wires. We had this grid of telegraph operators, and what happened in 1859 is a uh, British astronomer was observing the sun, and all of a sudden he saw what was observed as the first coronal mass ejection. He was observing the sun, he had a filter, he saw this big puff of material come out, and he goes, wow, that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And about two days later, all of the grid went down from all of the electronics that is at the time, which were primarily telegraph uh, operators and the grid network of the telegraph lines, these guys were shocked, that is literally shocked when they were at their stations. Many of the telegraph offices caught on fire as a result. And this is what happens with a coronal mass ejection. You've probably heard about this, that is, our power grid is just as susceptible today as perhaps the Carrington event was back then. We do not have a lot of protection out there against a coronal mass ejection. Okay? which means our electric grid could easily go down as a result. Okay, here's the CME. Now, notice uh, the difference here. This is, a, this is the SOHO satellite, uh, Solar Orbiting Heliospheric Observatory. And we've got a nice big bubble on this because that's where the sun is. And that would totally destroy the concept of trying to uh, uh, have enough, uh, I mean, this, this light would obviously uh, drown out this light. So we put a filter over it, and NASA does. And here is a coronal mass ejection. You can see that this does not emanate from the sun's surface. This is from the atmosphere, the corona of the sun. This stuff comes out, and there are just tremendous volumes of hydrogen, helium, and other ions that are being blown out into space as a result of this. Okay? Now, why am I telling you all this? Because it's magnetic. And magnetics in the sun are what we're talking about. Okay, so let's talk about the solar wind. The solar wind is constant. That is, the sun heats up. That is, the corona. The corona of the sun heats up the material to the point where it can have escape velocities. Hey, it's the same thing like a rocket ship. What does it take? 14,000, 1,400 kilometers per second. Whatever the escape velocity is of the Earth, that's how we can get rockets off the ground. Our escape velocity is such that we can do that. The sun's escape velocity, obviously, because it's 300 times the size of the earth, is much greater, but there are, there's still enough heat in the corona to accelerate the material, the ions, to the point where they can constantly escape the sun's surface, or the corona. Primarily, they're hydrogen and helium, and they emanate outwards towards Everything. In other words, it's not just one spot on the sun's surface that's doing this. It's the entire corona enveloping the sun that is emanating this material outwards, 360 degrees, 365 days a year. So therefore, we get a constant influx of solar wind. And all it is is ions, hydrogen, helium, that have been expelled from the sun coming through our entire solar system. And it turns out, you can see here, some places are a little bit more... Uh, concentrated in others. But it turns out that fortunately we have a magnetic field, which is exactly why our magnetic field is there. Because, I mean, not why it's there, but that is what protects us from the solar wind. The divergence based on our, our, our electric field, our dipole effect essentially, which is all generated by the interior part of the Earth, that is the core of the Earth rotating, nickel iron, etc. All the geology people know about this. At any rate, the point is, is that it is deflected by the earth and that protects us from all of the nasty stuff that the sun is constantly sending out. Okay? <coughs> so, here we go. 450 kilometers per second on average. 
It's a million miles per hour, so therefore, for the most part, the solar wind that is being deflected right now came from the sun, what, three days ago? Something like that. So the point is, is that this material, on average, is constantly bombarding the Earth, but deflected away, for the most part, by our magnetic field. Um, it's low density, has an, it has an effect on our magnetic field, especially if there are changes. So let's go take a look real quick and see what's the last one here. So, now, it alters the shape of our magnetic field. Okay, So here's a little picture to show you what's going on. Constant influx of solar wind, and as it approaches the Earth, our magnetic field diverts that around and protects us from all of the harmful effects. Now, what happens when all of a sudden we have a coronal mass ejection? This entire pattern here is going to change because all of a sudden now we've got an increasing current, essentially. So it's like all of a sudden having a flood upstream and you've got a normal, what you think is a normal amount of volume in the stream down below and all of a sudden you get a flash flood. Guess what that's going to do? Well, the same thing is going to happen here on the Earth. When we get a coronal mass ejection or large flares or uh, prominences, then that is going to affect the overall electrical characteristics of the Earth. Now, let's keep going. Let's talk about the solar cycle. This is now, see, I've spent all this time, and lecture should be over now, except we lost, what, what did I lose, 20 minutes? All right, <laughs> so now we've got what we call the solar cycle. In other words, the amount of material that's being expelled from the sun is not always constant. It varies, as I said earlier, based on an 11-year cycle. And that 11-year cycle is a result of changes in the sun's magnetic field, primarily instigated from the radiative zone and the convection zone. And then it's emanated out into space, and we see distinct differences in the geomagnetism of the sun. Let's go back and look at that since we have data that goes back to Galileo. Anybody that says that the sun maintains its normal output characteristics based on light and heat is correct, but if they say that it maintains that on the basis of magnetic activity, this right here tells you that they're wrong. Because sunspots are our primary example of what is going on. That is, it's the primary means of determining what the sun's or magnetic activity is. And you can see, going back to the time of Galileo, that we've got, actually this isn't quite that, this, there's another hundred years before this, mm -hmm. I'll show you in a minute. So this is roughly uh, 1750, so George and Ben and John and all those guys were out trying to figure out how to get around all the, uh, king, the king's problems. And then you can see that these cycles go up to where we have a hundred count period here. So on a daily basis, somebody has been counting sunspots since all the way back then. Mm -hmm. okay? And they published it in the literature, and so we know that it's, you know, there's, there's probably, obviously, more accuracy here than here. But you get the idea. We have gone through a lot of variations in the amount of sunspot activity, which is reflective of the sun's geomagnetic activity. So here we've got periods where we have zero sunspots, here, here. And then there are periods where, for the most part, there's 100, there's over 100, and then there's almost 200 in this cycle. These are 11 year cycles. And you can see that this pattern shows you that there is a tremendous variation in these magnetic fields and the sequence of the magnetic fields. When you get up to the present cycle here, one of the things that I'm going to show you is that we have had since roughly almost 1940, we have had an abnormal period over the last, what, five, six sunspot cycles, where we've had 200 counts of sunspots or more. That's quite unusual. So in other words, what I'm getting at here is within each cycle, if the following cycle is of the same amplitude or higher, then we have what we would call a megacycle pattern. Okay? So that's what this is, and then this is the most recent one. Now I drew that one in, okay? Because this uh, particular graph, I tried to find an update, couldn't find it, so I drew that in. The most recent cycle, 24, that we've just had, and we're on the downside of that right now. We're right here. We have virtually zero sunspots at the moment. 
This one was only a 100 count sunspot cycle at its peak. That's pretty unusual, especially based on the previous, what, six, eight sunspot cycles? Okay, so let's go and see if uh, we could be dangerous enough to make an interpretation here. Not necessarily an interpretation. Okay, now, does this have an effect on Earth's climate? I thought so a number of years ago, and it turns out there's a lot of people that think so, but we don't hear much about it. Look, if the geomagnetism of the sun is changing this drastically, and it's sending that material out in a 24-hour uh, you know, pattern, and then it's going to change over a period of 11 years, it has to have, I think, some effect on the upper atmosphere. We know that it has an effect on the ionosphere, because we ham operators go through this cycle, the peaks and the trials, every 11 years, and right now, it sucks to be a ham operator because if I want to go talk to Germany, I've got to have a pretty powerful station. Hmm. But five years from now, I'll be able to have a handheld walkie-talkie and go, hey, Sprechen Sie Deutsch. Mm -hmm. And that's going, to, that's going to be just fine because that's the way the pattern works. So does this have an effect? So basically what I'm going to tell you is, yes, it does. And I'm going to cop out for a little bit here as we continue on because I'm going to finish up. There have been recent papers that go into exhaustive detail about how certain temperature variations in the upper latitudes as a result of the Earth's magnetic field and its repulsion and attraction of the magnetism of the sun is affecting our tropospheric currents. It's making its way into the wind patterns. It's making its way into the oceanographic currents. And there is substantial justification of this. I don't have the time to go into all of it. Plus, the most recent paper that I found was one that was just published in January. And I have a flow chart that I'll show you here in just a few minutes to justify what I'm saying. And basically, let's go back to the beginning. Multiple working hypothesis, lots of different things that can cause variations in climate. But for the most part, the sun is the driving mechanism of all heat here on the Earth. I mean, that's pretty much it, unless you're in the mid-oceanic ridges, in which case that heat is emanating from the interior of the Earth. But for the most part, on the surface of the Earth, everything is dependent on what's coming out of the sun. So why wouldn't that have a significant influence on our long-term climate change? Okay? All right, so let's keep going here. Now, let's talk about the correlation, and let's talk about the causation. Okay? Back in... Galileo's time in the 1640s to 1720, there were no sunspots. Galileo saw the tail end of the sunspots in 1635. And until 1720, there were virtually no sunspots. This was noticed by a guy named Maunder, and he said, okay, there's a 70-year period here, and this period where there were no sunspots correlates exactly with the coldest mini ice age that has happened in recorded history. Here's a graph, and this is somewhat uh, less substantiated because we don't have, we didn't have the amount of data back then that we have, that we're able to get now. But here's the idea. From 1600 to 1720, this down here shows you that there were very few sunspots. Okay? So in other words, for some reason, the solar cycle stopped. And you can also see that there were no aurora. Now, I haven't mentioned aurora, but whenever we have a CME, whenever we have a flare, whenever we have prominences, if they are directed at the Earth, we're going to see an increase in auroral activity. Okay? And the reason is, is because we've got more magnetic ions coming, and they're going to be attracted to the polar regions of the Earth, because that's where our little dipole is located. Unless you're now looking at the Siberian Sea, which is why... It seems as though we're about to go through a polar flip, but that's well beyond what we need to talk about here. The idea here is these are the little green dots representative of aurora. Aurora were absent for almost 70 years, not to mention sunspots. And this correlates with the coldest period in Europe since recorded history. We, didn't, we don't have the data here in North America, but in Europe, the North Sea froze over continuously. And the Thames River in Britain 
was ice most of that entire 70 year period. And people were cold. So that is another one of our correlation is not causation, or is it? Okay, well, uh, it's well documented. And the existence of other grand minima, okay, let's just skip through this and let's go back and look at, uh-oh, Dalton minima. Uh-oh, my, my slide, oh, there it is, scared me. Okay, so let's go back and look at this. Here's your Dalton minimum. We just looked at the monitor <coughs> minimum over here. Okay, so the monitor minimum, very, very cold, correlates with no sunspot activity, no aurora. Look at what happened over in here from what, what is that, uh, 1800 to, what, 1840, 1835. This was a very, very cold period, one degree Celsius over 36 years. Correlates with less than 100 sunspots in each of the cycle peaks. Then we have this area over in here. I'm not sure that's given a name, but the point is, is that it was extremely cold in here. And <laughs> to show you how desperate some people are to make correlations here, <coughs> I saw something about the Titanic the other day and somebody said, yeah, it correlates with the sunspot cycles because we've got this grand, we've got this grand minima over here and those icebergs were farther south than they should have been and that was in 1912 and it correlates perfectly here. I think that's stretching it a little bit, but you get the idea. Okay? Now, let's talk about what has happened more recently. Here's our sunspot cycle since 1960. And if you remember, if we go back to 1940, 1946, we had another 200 peak cycle. So essentially since 1940, we've had a series of sunspot peaks that have been 150 to 200 sunspots at the highest amplitude. Notice how this correlates with the sea surface temperature, okay? Again, correlation is not causation. But the idea that we've gone through a six or seven period mega cycle where we've had 200 spots or more may help explain, or at least you can make the correlation, that this is why we have seen what has been recorded as an increase in surface temperature of the Earth. Now, what does that mean versus where we are today? This is that cycle that I had right at the end. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is a very detailed analysis or that is representation of the sunspots in the previous cycle, cycle 24, and actually we're still in cycle 24. So we've got at the peak one little month, this is on a monthly basis, so we had one month of 100 and for the most part the average was around 60. That is substantially less than what we've had in the previous six cycles where we easily averaged 150 sunspots or more. Now we are sitting down here. Okay? Zero sunspots. Okay? And let's talk about how this variability can affect Earth's climate. Now, this is the paper that I was referring to, and I have a copy of it. I don't have a copy for everybody. Just, I just brought my own copy. This is the one that was just released. And I spent the weekend going over this, and I decided there's no way that I can summarize everything that went on in this paper. These guys were exhausted in their detail. And it is a culmination of many, many years. They published countless papers before this. This is the most recent. Anyway, here's the idea. These guys are saying, all right, here's the flow diagram of how the solar wind affects our climate. And that is, at first it ends up as magnetospheric convection. It goes over to the geomagnetic activity of the sun. Particles precipitating from the sun's magnetosphere. Solar cosmic rays, I didn't even talk about that. They're kind of the seeds for clouds. And therefore, more cosmic rays, more clouds, that affects the climate. And then they go in just talking about changes in the electric potential or the ionosphere of the Earth, redistribution, height culmination of the atmosphere, changes in phase, water vapor, cloud formations, radiation balance, thermal baric field. They go into all of this detail, far beyond the scope of what I'm trying to tell you today. The idea here is, to me, it is entirely plausible, likely, that the sun's influence, geomagnetic-wise, is having an influence on our climate. To what degree? I don't know. These guys are saying at least 50%. Okay? 
So that means then, as we go through these various solar cycles, that our climate is going to change, along with all the other things that I listed in the beginning. So it's not just one thing. You've got to have a whole basket of tools here. And we as scientists, for the most part, understand that, but there seem to be people out there right now that are not trying to peddle that. And I think that perhaps the money that's coming from the United Nations to go for certain things that they want, that's influencing a lot of people. And to me, that's not the way to do science. Mm -hmm. So we have to incorporate all of the other possibilities here. And I have outlined a number of those, although I concentrated on just the solar variations here. Okay. So to finalize this, yeah. <coughs> uh-oh. No, I guess. No, it's working. Okay. Here's the thing about. All right. Here's my references. Okay. I only use two major references here. Most of this stuff I've accumulated over the last 10 or 15 years since I've been putting all this together. But these are the most important references. Here's the other thing. What happens if we go into a period where there's a monitor minimum? What if, now that we are on this decline, in other words, of the previous uh, six or so cycles, remember we've had 150 to 200 sunspot counts, lots of solar magnetic activity. We've had this increase in climate, or that is, increase in temperature. Let's say that it's not all a result of anthropogenic warming. Let's say that the sun really does have an effect. Now that we have gone through this previous cycle 24, we've only seen, for the most part, at the peak, 100 sunspots. For the most part, the average was 75 or 80. What happens if the next cycle, which should start within a year or two, <coughs> cycle 25, what happens if we have even fewer sunspots? Is there a possibility that the Earth could get colder? It turns out that the cause and effect, if that's the case, is going to be lagged significantly. So we might be looking at 20 or 30 years before we start seeing a, you know, a real effect of that. There was a real interesting book, and it's kind of a little bit of a fiction book, but it was interesting. It was called Twilight of Abundance. It was written by a geologist, an Australian geologist, who went through all of these solar cycles and said, what if we continue on this decline and we go through a monitor minimum? And if it turns out that the sun's magnetic effects really do affect our climate and we go into a period of cooling, what's that going to do? <clears throat> and here's what he did. And the guy was politically connected. And he looked at all of the data and he says, well, based on this, we're going to have for every one degree Celsius change in the upper latitudes and temperature cooling, we're going to have a 200 mile reduction in where we can grow our crops. In the northern hemisphere, that would be a 200-mile reduction to the south, and in the southern hemisphere, a 200-mile reduction to the north. That's going to decrease the yields for the food supply globally. If something like that happens, it's going to be fairly devastating, because all of a sudden, based on, well, let's just take, for example, the Middle East. They have to import virtually all of their vegetables, all of the heat, I mean, uh, the wheat, not heat. All of the wheat, all of the grain, that's imported because they don't grow that. So all of a sudden now, the growers, the United States, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, all of those people are going to be growing less because now I'm going to start shrinking the growing belt because I've got increased amounts of temperature in a shorter growing season. The export of materials is going to become more and more dicey. And then the next thing you know, when people get hungry, bad things happen. So this was kind of what his, his uh, push was. It was an interesting novel or interesting uh, exercise in, in what could possibly happen. But the other thing that we've all pointed out before is that what's wrong with carbon dioxide? Because the plants love it. And if it's warmer, that increases the growing belt. And yeah, it is causing a problem with the glaciers. There's no question about that. But the point is, is that better than global cooling, where if we went through two or three degrees of global cooling over the next 50 years, you're going to have a real problem with feeding the rest of the world. That's kind of what he was referring to. So that's it. I'm done. <laughs> I had it for an hour, but it turns out the hour started later than it should have.
It was worth waiting for three years. <laughs> <laughs> You're being way too kind, Bob. Uh, I appreciate it, though. Okay, so do, any questions? Oh, come on. You have an 11 year cycle. What's the mega cycle? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. The mega cycle is. I'll, I'll you. All right, I'm going to let Bob get it. Sometimes, the mega, well, in this case, we can say that the mega cycle was, what, 100 years? And what if it was 1,000 years? Here's the problem. The problem is the Earth could have been going through, I mean, not the Earth, the Sun could have been going through these magnetic convulsions, so to speak, over a very long period of time in which we have very little data to be able to ascertain what, what the effects really were. So this is, a, you know, this is a problem for the people who work with ice cores, okay? Because they can go back, I don't know, how many millions of years can you go back with an ice core? Anybody know? If you go, if you drill, you know. Drill in the thousands, tens of thousands. Yeah, tens of thousands. So, okay, so we're, we're kind of limited there. And, of course, we all know as geologists and uh, that, you know, 10,000 years over the, you know, over just 600 million years of life on the planet. And the life on the planet is really important because, obviously, we get a lot of information from the fossils, etc. But... 10,000 years is nothing, a small blip. So we really don't know how this has worked over a period of millennia. You know? Court. There's a uh, phenomenon you mentioned about the sun. It's, it's also rather true about the Earth. As you rise in altitude, the temperature decreases until you get to a certain point, and then it increases. And it becomes really quite quite hot up there. The atmosphere is very sparse. Yeah, I was going to say, the uh, molecules are pretty... Yeah, yeah it's far uh, you, you're far sort of out of the range where molecules are bumping into one another, but they're responding more to uh, ionization. And because of the, it's ionization that's causing the, the temperature increase, uh, the, that part of the atmosphere is really pretty hot. Well, and, and think about that. Same if the, way in the sun. Yeah, and think about that. If the ionization is changing because of density, and then the magnetic activity is fluctuating, then that's going to increase or decrease temperature depending on the density of, of the ions. That's correct. And that right there has got to have an influence on the Earth's weather systems and overall climate over a period of you know thousands of years. I mean, I just don't see how it can't have an effect. And I. And when I originally started doing this, I think I may have said this, but when I originally started doing this, you know, 15, 20 years ago, when I was teaching astronomy, um, I did not have the data that I have now. And that could be partially due to the fact that now I have access to Google Scholar. Now, that's a very important piece of information that we didn't have 20 years ago. I did not go to the library and go through exhaustive amounts of research to determine what had been done on solar effects and climate variation. With Google Scholar over the last 10 years, I have now recognized that there is voluminous information out there about researchers that are working on solar effects and climate change. Whereas 20 years ago, I did not have access to that information. Now, most of the information that I found on Google Scholar is less than 15 years old. Okay? So, all of this is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting that everybody has jumped on the band. I mean, it, everybody's getting more and more interested in this. I guess my problem with it is that the news media seems to want to propagate the idea of anthropogenic global warming. And that only. And I do believe, uh, Taylor and I were talking about this earlier, I don't think there's any doubt that industrialization has had an effect on Earth's climate to some degree. But it can't be the only explanation. It's like everything else that we've talked about as scientists. You know, there's lots of ways that we can explain this, and it's probably an accumulation of many of them. And as each one varies and oscillates from peaks to troughs, then depending on when they come together, that's going to give you a more amplified effect. So, and just like the volcanism, and just like um, meteorite impacts, which fortunately only occur every a couple of hundred million years, but <laughs> at least major ones. But obviously the, um, <clears throat> um, the volcanic effects are, and those are well documented because we've had a number of those that have occurred during recorded history. And we see that, what was it, 1814 or 15 was the summer without? 16. 1816? Yeah. yeah, that was a, the coldest summer on record. And, you know, so anyway, you get the idea.
So I'm just advocating that, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that this is a, the cause of everything, but I think it's a significant contributor and it needs to be addressed and the public needs to be more aware of this rather than just hearing the party line. But, but don't you think we ought to be listening to the 10-year-olds? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, any other questions? Bob? You had some fantastic slides. Very few of them had any indication where you got them. Where did you get so many of those slides? You know, so many, I've accumulated those over, the, over 20 years or so. Um, one of the things you can do that's interesting is that if you go to, um, well, for one thing, astronomy books are very good for that. Uh, I forget the name of the authors that have, the, I've gone to their website, they have a lot of these. But if you go to solar variations in the sun or solar activity, you Google it and then go to images. When you go up there to images, you will find that there are countless images that you can use. And most of them do not require or do not have a copyright infringement on them. So I'm very careful about that, even though I'm not using this for profit. But for the most part, copying all of those and putting them into a slide, um, most of them say, yeah, go ahead and do that. I mean, all of them. By the way, in that regard, do you have any objection to putting this online, uh, on YouTube? Oh, well, no. Bob always does this for us, so yeah. I, some of the people who weren't here were really okay. hoping you could do that. Yeah, yes. what about you? You want my thumb drive? <laughs> that would be good. helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Like I said, man, my name gets out there on the same page as G.K. Gilbert. That's the first thing. Uh, right. uh, <laughs> the giant and the minnow. <laughs> have you tried to publish it anywhere? No. No, I haven't. And, um, you know, I mean, I, 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 basically it's an accumulation of more or less layman's work. I mean, I'm not an astronomer. I know I've got a background in astronomy. I'm not a physicist. I've got a background in that. But, I mean, I can't go out and do this kind of research. So, no, I haven't tried to publish it because basically what I've done is nip little pieces out of everybody else's work as a teaching mechanism because, you know, I, I've worked for the Space Foundation for 10 years as a consultant. So, I went and taught teacher courses during the summer and I used most of this information and disseminating all of this to, to them to let them know that there's lots of other ways to explain uh, you know, climate change or any other thing that goes on with geology and geophysics. And so, uh, no, I have not tried to Did those School of Mine consensus professors give you any reason for <coughs> the criticism? Besides, it doesn't comport with their theory. That's, a, you know, I don't, I, the only thing that I can think of is that, I mean, they, they really did attack me from the rear. As a matter of fact, the students more or less told me to shut up. <laughs> because they came at me, and you know, and maybe I was a little bit more emphatic about going against the overall grain of carbon dioxide only and proposing this. Today I was a little more careful because, you know, I, I mean, I, I get what their emphasis was, but on the other hand, they did not do it professionally. They did not do it uh, in, a, um, in a congenial manner. As a matter of fact, one of the guys, I went up and talked to the guy afterwards that, that criticized me the most. And I asked the kids, I told them that the kids were appalled and they came up afterwards and they apologized to me. And I said, well, I'm going to go talk to one of them. They said, you what? <laughs> you know, and of course, I was 10 years younger then, probably a little beefier. I was not worried about what they were going to do. So I went over and I talked to them. And the guy basically, here's what he said. He said, we really don't appreciate you coming up here and telling our kids these things. And I looked at him and I said, they're only supposed to listen to what you tell them then? Mm -hmm. And that pretty much shut him up. But the point is, is that there's scientific basis behind the idea of solar variations as a result of magnetic activity and climate. So why not present that to the kids? But I feel that they may have had a partiality to the carbon dioxide rhetoric because maybe they were doing some sort of research and they had a UN grant. That's the only thing that I can think of. But the amazing thing to me is how closed-minded a lot of people are. I mean, hey, I've got my opinions. Everybody knows that and knows me well. But you know what? I am always you know, open to, some, you know, to other ideas. And when these guys said that, I just thought, man, they're really closed-minded. 
course. So, anyway, yes. I too was impressed with those slides, and I wonder if you could go back two or three slides where you were showing the sunspots for the last 50 years or so. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm thinking of an earlier slide where you showed the CO2 levels of during that this past 50 year period. No, there's one prior to that. This one? No. Uh, I think, yeah, that one. This one, yeah. Okay, so there's your an sunspots. earlier slide showed CO2 levels going from 315 up to 410 over this yeah. same time frame. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. Shouldn't the sunspot not, uh, levels be going up as well? These were. This is, this, this is your mega cycle in here. Okay. See, so you started in 19, well, 1935. Notice that you started getting, a, for the most part, a mega cycle that could correlate with at least 100 to 150 sunspots. Each successive cycle, that one's 200, this one was, a, was, was an anomaly. And then we went back up to 150 to 180, then we went back up to 150, 180, and then we started tapering off. So if you look, you know, the correlation, it goes right back to correlation, is not causation, but... Uh, no, that's not where I wanted to go, I wanted to go this way. That way. So, this is the same type of excuse that I used, remember when I... I started attack, not attacking, when I started clarifying the slide back with the Keeling curve. And I said that the sea surface temperature or the overall in, uh, uh, temperature of the surface of the earth was increasing in correlation to the Keeling curve. I'm doing the same thing here. So I'm more or less being somewhat hypocritical. Because I'm saying that, look, here we have these excessive cycles of 150 to 200 sunspots over the course of this, what, 100 years or whatever, one, two, three, four, maybe 50 or 60 years. And I'm also seeing that there is an increase in surface temperature of the Earth as a result of that. Now, that's another correlation, it's not causation. So, as I said, I think that if we factor in everything here, of the possibilities of why we're seeing climate change, probably at least half a dozen of those are having some effect. <clears throat> it's not just one thing. Anyway, so yes. what I'm hearing you say is, if we're worried about global warming, and if we don't even have control of half of it, it's even more important we take care of the half we have control of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And now I'm going to say something now that will get me into really big trouble. But I'm really good at that. <laughs> I mean, the ultimate, we can talk about all the symptoms all we want. The ultimate problem is we cannot have 8 billion people on the planet all wanting to live like we have been fortunate enough to live in America. That's, it, it can't, I just don't see how that can happen. And it frustrates me that people aren't talking about that as the real problem. Because, just like I was reluctant to bring that up, but this is a, I think, a, not a hostile audience, <laughs> but the point is, like I say, you know, if we go to 10 billion people in the next 25 years and everybody wants a piece of the pie, we get to a point where, I mean, the, the bottom line is you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. Mm -hmm. And that's, at some point in time, we've got to address that as human beings. We've got to address that. And that gets you in a lot of trouble because somebody says, oh, you, you need some kind of a Nazi or whatever, you know. Anyway, today we've got all kinds of labels for people that advocate something like that because we just were real quick to start throwing names out and, and, and labeling people. But I think ultimately as scientists, you've got to address the population problem and the impact that all of us are having collectively on the planet. Eight billion people, man, that's, that's a lot of folks. And 10 billion. I mean, in 20 years, that's what they're projected. I mean, it, it, you know. So, yeah, we've got a lot of problems, but ultimately I think it relates to the number of, of people and how do, you, how do you address that? Man, I don't know. Good luck with that. My kids and your kids are going to have to deal with that. I think. So anyway, Court. Anyway, you're talking about these uh, people jumping all over you for your views on climate and so forth. Uh, <coughs> recent cases, uh, Will Happer, who's been a 
appointed by the president. And you set up this committee to look at uh, both sides or many sides of the issue about climate change and so forth. And people are jumping all over Will Happer because, well, he's all he does is uh, atomic physics, and he, he never he, he's not a climate scientist. Well, you know the only relationship between carbon dioxide and climate has to do with the interaction of radiation with molecules, which is his specialty and which is not taught in, clay, in classes in climate. So, but uh, they're, they're just all too willing to call names. I know. Yeah, we do. We quickly yeah. label people. And yeah. it's, I mean, it's obviously a problem going on right now. It's, it's tough for me with my girls. I mean, I, you know, I'm an old guy. I had kids late in life. I've got two teenage daughters. And, you know, I see the things that they're being taught in school, and I see the things they're being told. Bob and I need to talk about this because they both just had an economics course. And, <laughs> and you know, that all they talk about is Keynesian economics. And I go, well, did anybody mention Hyatt? Who's that? <laughs> you know, I mean, so you're not getting a lot of alternative things, you know, that there's other explanations, there's other theories, there's other models. And it, to me, that's a real problem because I think back in our day, I mean, you know, I'm talking about when I was educated back in the 60s and 70s, you know, we, that's the emphasis of our education back then was a lot of different ways to look at this. And your, your job, if you're going to get into science, is to entertain all of these ideas and recognize that data can be acquired and you may not have, you know, you may not be able to explain them, but you still got to take them as for what they are. Is it good data? You know, and we don't do that now. We, we seem to have this, this desire to go down the path of, I have an agenda as a scientist because this is where I'm getting my grants and I'm going to favor all of the agenda that's, I mean, all of the data that supports that and discard the other. And that's, we all know that's not good science. So, anyway, Alex. A lot of the, I, my opinion, a lot of the, the climate controversies got nothing to do with the science, whether it's uh, solar cycles or CO2 or whatever. You and I, when we were educated, all of us when we were educated, we went out to change the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's good. We think of that as good. What you're seeing politically now is we've got to keep the world the way it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's too bad the glaciers melt, but that's going to, like you say, a little bit of warmth is going to help, especially with the, those 8 to 10 billion people that are... Uh, no, the, the thing that we have the advantage have over in being geologists, I'm preaching the choir here, is that you know we have gone through historical geology and we understand that there have been tremendous amounts of changes in the Earth's atmosphere, the biosphere, the, 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 the hydrosphere. I mean, everything has changed throughout geologic time. And, and now that things are changing, everybody seems to be you know going bonkers about it. I mean, it's like, <laughs> welcome to Earth! Yeah. You know? <laughs> Go take an earth science course. You know? Well, that's basically the way I'll answer it when somebody says, what do you think about carbon dioxide is doing? Well, I'll say, yeah, I think there's climate change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now, if you get labeled as a denier, then all of a sudden everybody's all over you, you know? I mean, if you're a political candidate and you say, well, I still question global warming as a result of anthropogenic activity, that's front, line, that's front page news and they're all calling you a... A denier and you're, uh, you know, uh, whatever word they want to label you. It's like, well, you know, what's wrong with entertaining the possibility but not necessarily making a 100% commitment? Because right now we don't have all the data. No? So, anyway. Jay, okay, a quick comment on the slide right here behind you. Yeah. I've always struggled with that because I see no correlation between those two lines. Yeah, well, I think that's kind of the, 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 the whole idea here is that this is... A, this is a, a, an anomaly, that is the changes in sea surface temperature above or below the average, and it's showing that there has been a slight increase over the last, what, 60 years? And then this is showing you the number of solar cycles and the intensity of the solar activity over those 60 years to show you that there may be an omega cycle effect. Right, but I guess I'm, I'm not seeing that in, in, the, in the data up there. I see a a roller coaster in the red line and, and a gradual increase in the blue line, but but it's hard for me to draw that conclusion yeah. that that there's a connection between those two. Well, does the change in sea temperature lag? 
that's that's the main point. That that is, it appears as though magnetic activity from the sun. If we're going to use everything that I was saying as a possible correlation, it occurs over a very long period of time. In other words, we may have 20 or 30 years before the influence actually takes effect. Right, right. You mentioned that earlier, and and that's a good point. But you're not seeing it in this slide. I think that slide doesn't show the period before the mega cycle. So. I look at it kind of like if you have a burner on a stove and it's turned up hotter for four cycles, then in this slide it's showing the temperature that's yeah. going up. And if you look before this slide, then it would be when the burner was lower on yeah. average. But I, that's this slide would be more effective if I had more data down in the, the previous thing, hundred years. The other thing about the slides, we're not even talking about a full degree change in, in yeah. surface temperature, yeah. right? Uh, what is the range? 0.3? Maybe point four. And see, here's minus yeah, I, point three. I, I know what you're talking about. And here's the other thing that bothers me about this. From all the things that I've looked at when I've been doing the research on this for 20 years, there's a big discrepancy in whose data you're going to use and who collected the data. Here's what? Hmm? Data. Who collected the data? Whose are you going to use? So, in other words, it's not consistent. And that is a real problem. So, here's what it's like as geologists. I've got a geologic map, and all of a sudden, if, I, if, if, if I'm suspicious that the strikes and dips were not taken properly, then the map doesn't mean a whole lot to me. Now, if I have five geologists go out and take the strikes and dips, uh, populating or overpopulating the earth, Mother Nature has a way of taking care of all this. We just might not like the outcome. You know? Insects seem to survive very well. You know, they have. I've always said, whenever I go out in the field and, and I'm inundated by all the bugs, I go, planet insect. That's what this is. It's planet insect. The insects can adapt to virtually anything. And when you go up to the north slope and you go see all the caribou migrating, good luck with that. You better have a screen to keep all the mosquitoes off. So you, you know, <laughs> because the insects, they're prolific, aren't they? So, anyway. Hey, this was fun. Yeah. I enjoyed Thank this. You. Thank you. Thank you. So it was worth three years, Beth? <laughs> <laughs> What's your plan on Tuesday?